morning I want to share with you two scripture readings. The first one is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. This is right after what we think of as the traditional Christmas story. And it begins with them at the temple. It says, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be concentrated to the, consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised... You now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child and father, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul also. And then from John's Gospel, this is this is a longer passage, but I want to read this. This is this is about Jesus healing a man born blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been, born, he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been born, been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. 
Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Jesus said, You have now seen him. Oh, I'm sorry. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. There was a little boy who was afraid of the dark, and one night his mother asked him to go out to the back porch and bring her the broom. And the little boy turned to his mother and said, Mama, I don't want to go out. The, it's dark. And the mother smiled reassuringly at her son. You don't have to be afraid of the dark. She said, Jesus is out there. He'll look after you and protect you. And the little boy looked at his mother and asked, Are you sure he's out there? Yes, I'm sure. He's everywhere, and he's always ready to help you whenever you need him, she said. The little boy thought about that for a moment and then went out the back door and he cracked it a little. And peering out into the darkness, he said, Jesus, if you're out there, would you please hand me the broom? You know, a lot of us, I think whether we'll admit it or not, I've said this before, is I think many people, kids and adults, are afraid of the dark. Now, I can't imagine losing my ability to see one moment everything around you is clear and bright and the next moment you're in complete darkness. But this blind man has only ever seen darkness. He's never seen a rainbow, the glory of a sunset, the sweet face of an infant, or the beauty of a new fallen snow. What an illustration of fallen humankind. On our own, we're blind and cannot see the beauty of God. In chapter 8, Jesus stood before the crowd and said that he was the light of the world. And Jesus makes the same claim in John 9, 5. In our reading from Luke, we hear Simeon tell Mary that her infant will be a light for the revel revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. This mirac miracle of healing the blind man authenticates his claim. Jesus is the light of the world. He alone has the power to remove the darkness. Only Jesus, the light of the world, has power to give sight to the blind. Now, we see right off the blindness of humanity. As Jesus passes by, he sees a, my, a man blind from birth. Now, knowing Jesus, we know that he was, I'm sure he was compassionate toward this man. It's interesting that when we read through the Gospels, we hear the Gospels record more cases of blindness healed than any other affliction. There's one deaf and dumb person healed, one sick of palsy, one sick from a fever, two instances of lepers healed, but five people that were blind cured. I think that tells us how much humanity is spiritually in the dark. This man here is a beggar. Sinners are beggars too, possessing nothing of our own dependent on God's charity. And we think a blind beggar, what an object of need and helplessness. But did you notice how the, how the disciples look at this man? And they just start theorizing and philosophizing about who sinned while being blind, totally to this man's needs. Why else was this man born blind if someone had not done something wrong? See, their attitude then was, if, if they were all righteous, then God would never, would have, wouldn't have done this, and would have been forced to respond with blessing. That's, that's legalism, right? I do something for God, he does something for me. But we know that this man's blindness had nothing to do with sin. 
And there's a lot, you know, we're not going to go totally into this topic here, but to tell you that there's a lot of suffering, we know there's a lot of suffering that has nothing to do with people sinning. Now, Jesus is very clear. His outlook on sin and death are primarily opportunities, he says, for the glory of God to be revealed. God has a, has a wise purpose for affliction. Do you know that in your own life when you've had troubles? I've seen that witnessed in, in lives of other Christians. One of my favorite people is Joni Arasitata. I don't know if you, how many of you know, know her. In 1967, 1967, she dove into a pool and became a quadriplegic. She's paralyzed from the shoulders down. Now, she was 16, 17 at that age. She, she came to know the Lord. She was depressed, but she came to know the Lord, and she has served him. And she's had a strong, strong ministry of telling people about Jesus Christ, including helping people with disabilities. I think what a wonderful way, how horrible that this happened to her, but how wonderful that she was able to use her affliction for God's glory so that other people would know Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus at this point is saying, I've got to make the most of my opportunities. It won't be long. He knows that his time is, is short. And as long as he's in the world, he's the light of the world. Ever since his birth, we know that his birth came with what? A beautiful, huge star. You know that Jesus has, has lit up the world. And Jesus is going to show himself by communicating sight and salvation to this fine beggar. Now, do you like the method he uses? What does he do? He spits on the ground, he makes mud, he puts the mud on the man's eyes, and he sends him off to wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I think it's quite interesting to think about why Jesus healed the man this way. We know Jesus could have just said, I mean, sometimes Jesus just said, hey, he's healed, and he's healed, right? This is interesting, though. Michael Card talks about in his in his commentary how, listen to this, the Pharisees had forbidden spitting on the Sabbath. Okay, whoa. So if you, did you know that? According to the Pharisees, you've sinned if you spit on the Sabbath. You write that down. Because, here's why, specifically they cautioned that spit might run downhill and make mud, and making mud is work. And there's not supposed to be work on the Sabbath. And if you listen, if you listen closely as the Pharisees investigate the healing, they're concerned specifically about the mud and the question of who made the mud. They're blind to the man. They're blind to his need. They can't see the miracle because they're so focused on the violation of their oral tradition. There is nowhere in the Bible that it says you can't make, you can't spit on Sunday. Okay. Now I love the man. He's obedient. He goes. He washes. He comes back seeing. I love it. He doesn't ask questions. He doesn't try to reason with Jesus. No, he he is bl he blindly, the man blindly, figuratively and literally, obeys Jesus and heals. I think, how does he get there? How's he, how's he walking and go to the pool? But he does. He gets there. And you think, what a miracle! If you saw somebody who was born blind and had their sight restored, their start not even restored, but given to them for the first time, I think you would rejoice. It reminds me of those Facebook videos where they put um, a cochlear implant in the baby to begin with. Have any of you seen these? And they put the hear, they put it make, makes doesn't it make you tear up? They put the little hearing aid in the baby, and the baby looks and he he or she looks right at his mother like that's what she, like that's what she sounds like. Now every time you watch that, when you think about that, you have to just rejoice at this little child having hearing for the first time. But I think, what does the crowd do? They don't rejoice. They start speculating. Is this the guy who used to beg? They keep saying again and again, how did it happen? They don't ask who. That's the real question. They want to satisfy their curiosity. They don't think they really have a desire to know who Jesus is. Now, the man just says what he saw. He says, Jesus made mud, and he anointed my eyes, and he said, go wash. I did, and I got sight. He may not have known may not have seen Jesus, but he knows the name of Jesus. Now, when the Pharisees, when the people can't see Jesus or the miracle, they take the man to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are afraid. They are afraid of something new bursting out of Judaism. See, attacks from the outside are easier, but attacks from the inside, when, when people arise from within their Jewish world claiming to act, in the name of the one true God, started 
start doing things that, that crack their system from top to bottom. I mean, gosh, we wouldn't want people spitting on Sunday. What kind of world would this be, right? They can't take it. And all they see is fear and their set of rules. And the parents are afraid too. They're like, oh my gosh, we don't want to get kicked out of the, we don't want to get kicked out either. They're afraid for their social standing, their livelihood, perhaps even their lives. And so this fear leads the Pharisees back once again to the man. I think, what about ourselves? I wonder where in our lives we're in the dark, allowing fear and resentment and anxiety to cloud our vision. There are a lot of dark places in our world and in our lives where our understanding, our faith, our love are restricted. Sometimes we think, oh, this is a situation that we're never going to make your way through. Now, if you've ever been up in the middle of the night in the dark and it feels like you're trying to feel your way through, it can seem like forever until you get to the light. But when we're fearful, that's what we've got to do is we've got to keep looking for the light, looking for Jesus, praying for glimpses of him and following him out of the dark and into the light. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now, the Pharisees, you notice they utterly refuse to see Jesus at all. And they're bound and determined that they're going to drive a wedge between God and Jesus. Now, <laughs> it's kind of funny when you think about it. You know, if anything good has happened, what they're saying is it was God's work and Jesus has nothing to do with it. Now, the man in, in verse 17 says Jesus is a prophet, but as he goes along, his spiritual sight improves. And when the Pharisees say, give glory to God, it's like, it's like our, saying, our saying, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They've concluded Jesus is a sinner. They're no longer seeking the truth. They're pressuring the man to conform, but he refuses. And the more he goes along, did you notice that? The more he goes along, the more he can see about Jesus. Asked again, he says, I don't know if Jesus is a sinner, but he says, one, I know once I was blind and now I can see. And John wants us to see that the man is giving God the glory. He's sticking to his story and he's insisting Jesus healed him and God worked through him. But the Pharisees have made up their minds. And this opening question of whether the man's blindness was caused by his own sin or that of his parents have been answered for them. And they say to him, you've been born in sin from top to bottom. But John wants us to see that not only did this man, original, his original blindness had nothing to do with his sin, his parents' sin, but that the presence of Jesus delivers people from everything that's wrong with them, spiritually, physically, and mentally. Now, in this Christmas season, John is asking us to make up our minds. Will we, like the man born blind, be led toward the light of Jesus, or will we, like the Pharisees, go toward the darkness? John is saying to his readers, take a really good look at what Jesus did here. Because when your eyes are open, there's only one conclusion to be drawn. Just as Moses shocked the magicians of Egypt by doing things they couldn't copy, that's Exodus 8. Jesus is now shocking the world by doing things for which the only explanation is that God is powerfully at work. Now the Pharisee is at this point, they've had enough. And they say to him, what? They're like, get out and don't come back. Imagine them. Do it just strikes me that they can do that. They do that right in the right, right by Jesus. And from that moment on, his parents and his friends will have nothing to do with him. He can't purchase food from any loyal Jew. He's persona non grata. Now we get to the best part of the story. All this time, you notice all this time as Jesus is gone, but here comes. Here comes Jesus. The second time Jesus comes and finds the man. And Jesus asks him one simple question. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, we've got to remember that this man, he may have been next to Jesus, but he never has actually physically seen Jesus. And so in this just charming simplicity, he says, if you tell me, I will believe. And Jesus says, literally, hey, you're looking at him. And this nameless man makes his final step in realizing who Jesus is. When he calls him by the name Lord, he worships him. Having come into the world for judgment, Jesus is not condemning as a judge, but as a light. Now we know when the light is turned on, it reveals all. All you got to do is not dust for, right? Some of us are laughing. You got to, don't dust for like four weeks 
and then have a really bright day, right? And you go, whoa, okay, all right? The Pharisees over here and say, are we blind too? No, they say, no, who's the judge? See, who's, who, that's the question here is who's the authority who, to judge who can see and who are seeing, seeing a fuzzy out of focus, focus image? Jesus is the only one who has the right to say who can see clearly. And while the Pharisees think they can see clearly, they don't see anything at all. They're so quick to see sin in someone else, but they're blind to the sin in their own hearts and minds and lives. And not only are they wrong, but they've constructed a system with which they will never see that they're wrong. They refuse any light or air to penetrate their world. You know, it's one thing to be genuinely mistaken and to be open to new evidence and new insights, but their world is sealed up tight. Jesus is the light of the world, and he has the power to give sight to the blind. And I think, will we choose to ask Jesus to show us our spiritual blind spots? Because you know what? Everybody in this story is blind but Jesus. The disciples, the man's parents, finally the Pharisees, who were the blindest of all. But, you know, it's so easy to point fingers, right? But we point fingers and we think, what about the blind spots of us? Show us where we're blind. Show, open your light to us. You know, really, I think our culture thinks, okay, Christmas is over, right? It's done. Go, go to Dollar General. They already got their Valentine candy out, and um, you can get your Cadbury eggs. Okay. They're on to the next, not judging them here. they got to sell stuff. They're on to the next holiday. Right? But for us, the days of Christmas start at Christmas. And we, we are at the time of year, right, where it's also starting to get just a little bit lighter every day. Do you see that? Even if it's only a couple minutes. We need the light of Jesus Christ. And again and again and again, we've got to return to the truth of God's word. For myself, I've got to challenge myself to see it with new eyes, to not assume I know everything about Jesus, to see him again and again and again with fresh eyes, to see the possibilities of all that Jesus can do. The power of lies and of evil in our world is strong. It is so easy to be deceived. It's easy to turn and not see the hurt around you. And we've got to let Jesus open our eyes so we can see others as he sees them. And we must have the eyes of Jesus full of grace and mercy instead of seeing the other person's sin. I hope that as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we'll, God will show us again and again our need for a Savior. Arthur Pink says it so well about our need. He says, such a one needs more than light. He needs the capacity given him to see the light. It's not a matter of mending his glasses, that would be reformation, or of correcting his vision, education, and culture, or of eye ointment, religion. None of these reach or can reach the root of the trouble. The natural person is born blind spiritually, and a faculty missing at birth cannot be supplied by extra cultivation of the others. Pink goes on to say, man needs a savior from the time he draws his very first breath. Friends, as we look at the manger, are we sensible enough to admit we're blind and in need of a savior? If we accept that we're lost, then Jesus offered us, offers us salvation. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I find found was blind, but now I see. Amen. Oh,